The uh, hearing will reconvene. <coughs> uh, thank uh, those of you who uh, in the audience who could stay and thank the witnesses for uh, remaining with us. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Danier, the situation in the Ogaden region of Ethiopia is deeply concerning, uh, troubling, as you've already mentioned, <clears throat> considering reports of sexual violence perpetrated by Ethiopian troops and the effective isolation of the region imposed by the Ethiopian government. Since the government suspended food aid to Ogaden in 2006, it seems the humanitarian situation has continued to deteriorate, yet very little has been done by the international community to pressure the Ethiopian government to peacefully resolve the issue in the Ogaden. In your opinion, why has so little been done to engage the Ethiopian government on this issue? And given that the Ogaden region is cut off from uh, contact with outside entities and access to the region is highly restricted, from what sources are we able to collect information on the status and the condition of the inhabitants in the Ogaden? I think most of the information that we're getting about the Ogaden comes from the refugees uh, near the border in Kenya. Um, there are also human rights groups, uh, journalists, uh, who have gone into the Ogaden uh, without the permission of the Ethiopian government, and they have documented uh, what uh, they have seen, interviews of uh, the victims. Um, I have gone at least three times in the past couple of years, uh, went into the refugee camps and in Nairobi, and uh, documented uh, a number of interviews of the victims, uh, as well as uh, conditions internally. Um, what's different about the Ogaden is that rarely you will see reporting about the atrocities that are being committed. The targeting in the Ogaden um, is exclusively against civilians, especially women. Uh, rape is one of the methods used by the Ethiopian security, as well as hanging. Uh, we have a number of cases of individuals who were hanged. One particular person that comes to mind that uh, you and I had met two years ago and last year is a young lady named Redwan. Uh, she was uh, hanged by the Ethiopian security, left for dead. Uh, fortunately for her, she wasn't dead and she was helped out, moved into a neighboring country, and she's still awaiting for the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency to process her status. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, uh, Ms. Uh, Lefkow, uh, the Ethiopian judiciary has been under severe criticism for years by some observers and opposition groups for allegedly lacking independence and effectiveness. Do you agree with this assessment and criticism and what are the major problems facing Ethiopia's judiciary? What can, in your opinion, the U.S. do to help strengthen the independence of the judiciary in Ethiopia? I'd be happy to try and address that. May I also add a, a couple of points with regard to your question on, on the Ogaden area? Yes. Um, maybe if I start with that, um, this is a, this, the allegations of, of abuses in the Ogaden is, a, is an issue that Human Rights Watch has been extremely concerned about over the last three years. Um, we did a very uh, in-depth investigation in 2007 into these, uh, into these allegations and, and documented crimes that we, in our assessment, amounted to war crimes and crimes against humanity. So these are very, very serious crimes by the Ethiopian military, to some extent also by uh, the Ogaden National Liberation Front. Uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, clean. Their record is not entirely clean either. It's, I think it's important to, to, to say that clearly. Um, but the, 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 the scale of the abuses of against civilians was overwhelmingly, um, for the most part, on the part of the Ethiopian military. Um, in our assessment, the... Uh, patterns of crimes declined somewhat in 2000, 2007, 2008, um, after the, the, the initial campaign by the government. 
we've actually been doing another set of research just in the last few months on, on what's happening in yogurt and trying to get an updated picture of what's happening on the ground because, as you know, it's extremely difficult um, to get solid and credible information. Um, and we are very concerned about some ongoing uh, military clashes in the region and ongoing targeting of civilians. Um, another element, I think there are two new elements that we're seeing in the region. One is that the, the regional government in Somali region has established um, a new, a, almost a paramilitary force called the New Police. And it's these forces that seem to be responsible for a lot of abuses against civilians now. So this is a new development since 2008. The other, I think, new element in, in the Ogden area is a real expansion of oil development. We were hearing this from dozens of people we spoke to just last month um, of, a, of an expansion of the oil uh, exploration in the area, which is having a, a kind of a knock-on effect because this is a conflict zone and a lot of people are pastoralists, uh, nomadic herders, and they're actually not able to go to their traditional lands anymore because the oil companies with Ethiopian military support have actually um, seemingly fenced off large areas. So this is a, a kind of new dynamic that we're seeing, which I think will have some serious effects on, 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 on the ground and on civilians. Um, if on I may that, on that point, do you, uh, is there the presence of the uh, People's Republic of China's military there or, or security forces armed from China since it's PetroChina that uh, is doing the exploration in the Ogaden? Um, not that we're aware of. The security forces seem to be, um, for the oil, it seems to be primarily Ethiopian military, so the, the, the National mm -hmm. Defense Forces. Okay. Um, I know that there several years ago, though, there was a conflict with the OLF and I think a, a number of uh, Chinese uh, security forces were killed uh, sort of in a combat with uh, uh, OLF and Chinese uh, military or par paramilitary or security. Uh, so, okay, and you can go on. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the other issue I wanted to mention, I mean, I, I guess just in relation to the Ogden, I think there's a couple of points worth making. I think with regard to the U.S. policy, I think there's, a, you know, a positive and negative side to the U.S. positioning, the government positioning on, on Ogden. On the one hand, I think the U.S. has been pressing quite hard for humanitarian access over the last few years. Um, I think there is a recognition that the humanitarian situation in the Ogaden area has been very, very serious uh, and continues to be very serious. And I think that's, that's an important positive um, uh, you know, position. I think the problem is, is that um, there hasn't been enough pushback on the fact that the Ethiopian government has essentially closed down this region to any kind of independent access. Journalists can't get in there. Diplomats can't get in there. We certainly can't get in there. Um, you know, this, this, they have effectively um, in, in established a, an information blackout on the Ogaden area. And I think there needs to be much greater challenging of this by the US and by other of Ethiopia's partners. Um, and I think on that score, you know, what we see, the US, the National Security Council statement after the elections last month was an important signal of it seems of a, of a shift in US rhetoric towards Ethiopia. I think it was a strong statement, it was a welcome statement of concern about the electoral process. But what we need to see is that um, those words matched by action and, and to see um, the apparent greater concern for the human rights situation translate into real policy consequences for Ethiopia if it does not shift course. Thank you very much. Just finally, Mr. Uh, Okech, um, could you uh, explain to us the relevance um, of the um, change in the split in the energy portfolio uh, by the President Bashir uh, into three separating oil, mining, and electricity recently, and uh, 
uh, has the cooperation of the NCP changed or improved after the national election uh, and the recent appointment of the new cabinet? Uh, if you can give me your assessment of the new appointees in the North and, uh, as I mentioned, the, sp the splitting of the energy portfolio, do you think this has something to do with the upcoming uh, referendum in January 9, 2011? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the decision to split the Ministry of, uh, of Mining and, uh, and Energy into three separate ministries is driven by, one, the consideration that possibly the outcome of the referendum may be secession of Southern Sudan, where petroleum is largely produced in Southern Sudan, and it may be a ministry that may not uh, be there after the referendum in Northern Sudan, or possibly having very limited uh, functions. Uh, and in that, in that case also, the National Congress Party has been investing uh, in the center of Sudan, particularly in the, in the northern parts of, uh, of Sudan, in building dams for the production of energy from hydroelectrical uh, power, as well as also uh, developing uh, plans to, to uh, develop agricultural irrigated schemes along the Nile, particularly in northern Sudan. Uh, now this program of building hydroelectric uh, power and dams in northern Sudan has caused the very serious concerns that would uh, need attention by the international community and the government of the United States. The, the Nubian people who are a marginalized people in the far north of northern Sudan are under attack and are in a danger of extinction because the process of the constructions of the, of the dams is being done without their consultation. Their villages and land is being submerged underwater. Also, there is a intentional cultural genocide that is uh, being carried out where the ancient uh, uh, civilization uh, of the Nubian people is being destroyed and submerged underwater. This is a very, this is going to be a loss not only to the Sudanese people, not to the Nubian people, uh, this is uh, a human um, uh, patrimony that need to be protected. Uh, also, the land of the Nubian people is being uh, usurped from them. They are being displaced and being sent to inhospitable uh, areas without compensation. And uh, actually tomorrow here in Washington, there is going to be a memorial by the Nubian people uh, to, to remember the victims who have been killed by the Sudanese authorities resisting to defend their land uh, from being usurped in the process of building dams. So the Ministry of Energy is a ministry that is going to focus in development of uh, energy, particularly hydroelectric uh, energy, and building of dams. While the mining, the third ministry, uh, is being separated, with the aim of development of uh, mineral resources, particularly in Eastern Sudan, especially gold, and the people of Eastern Sudan uh, are marginalized, are excluded from these processes. Their land is being taken, their resources are being used, and the uh, revenues from these, uh, the, the exploitation of the mineral resources in Eastern Sudan are not being brought to benefit the marginalized people of Eastern Sudan, particularly the Bija people whose uh, land these resources are found. Again, there is also an issue of uh, concentration of the opportunities of development in 
the center and exploitation of resources of the marginalized areas like the far north or the east uh, in the benefit of the elites, ruling elites in Khartoum uh, to the total marginalization and exclusion of the people of Eastern Sudan, uh, particularly the Bijar. So the petroleum ministry now has been assigned or has been allocated to uh, an SPLM, uh, to the SPLM, and an SPLM minister would be developing uh, these, uh, this portfolio. Uh, I believe the main important task would be to bring in transparency in how the oil sector has been developed. There has been serious lack of transparency. The National Congress has developed this sector exclusively and in a very uh, controlled, tight uh, process, excluding the government of Southern Sudan from participating in the management of the, the, the oil uh, sector, whether in the development of the production in the fields or in the management of uh, its transport and processing, as well as in the uh, auction and sale of the Sudanese uh, petroleum. Reports, including of international independent organization like Global Witness, indicate that Southern Sudan has been sheeted for up to nearly 26% of its share, which is uh, giving Southern Sudan less than half of its uh, deserved rights. And this is a serious um, issue. With the formation of the government of national unity or the government of, uh, of Sudan and Khartoum, uh, definitely there is cooperation. Uh, the SPLM has uh, been allocated 30% uh, of, the, of the total uh, portfolios representing Southern Sudan, having been the party that has won election in the South, while the remaining 70% uh, is uh, occupied by the National Congress Party and other parties associated uh, with, uh, with it or allied uh, to, to the National Congress Party. We are desirous to develop uh, better relations with the National Congress as we manage the transition of our country in the remaining short period of the interim period, possibly to emerge as two independent states. And it is only through uh, dialogue and uh, serious discussions that uh, the parties are required to have uh, that we would be able to avoid a return to war and avoid a collapse of the peace, but achieve a transition to permanent uh, peace, even if that would mean establishment or appearance of two states. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> At this time, <coughs> before I turn over to the ranking member, let me recognize in the audience the Honorable uh, Asha Abdallah, Chairperson of the Somalis Women's Parliamentary Association. Would you stand, please, and be recognized? Thank you. We're very pleased to have you with us here. <clears throat> Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Aiden and uh, Mr. Mankaus, could you tell us, do you believe that the United States is doing enough with regards to Somalia, resources policy-wise and the like? Ms. Aiden? Uh, thank you. First of all, um, as, a, as a student who is trained in medicine, I have always learned uh, the importance of history, knowing the history of the patient in order to treat, to treat the patient. I believe uh, our government, United States government, whether it's uh, this one or the previous ones, uh, truly uh, missed the opportunity to study the history of the conflict and all the contributors of that conflict. When Ethiopia invaded Somalia back in 2006, we have consistently spoke to the State Department, discouraging that support should not be given to the invasion. And of course, we thought that was an ill-advised foreign policy that was not going to work, and we found out the results. Uh, it created more radicals in Somalia, in the region, and everybody else who's involved sees Sees that was the most uh, worst the worst decision the United States has ever made to support Ethiopia. Now coming back, if the administration, the current administration, is doing enough, I would say no. And the reason I say that is because 
US administration is depending always on neighboring countries to understand Somalia and to find cure to the disease that lies on land. We see 150 ships are in the seas outside Somalia, all trying to stop the piracy, when in fact the piracy is the symptom, it's not the disease. The disease lies on land, and that's to find political stability in Somalia. Therefore, what the United States government should do is instead of depending on the intelligence collected by the Ethiopian government, Kenyan or Ugandese, to actually do things there on their own way and engage the Somali people, especially the diaspora. There is a huge force of Somali diaspora sitting outside Somalia. Some neighboring countries, Somalis in the diaspora send every year what we know documented by the UNDP, $1.5 billion every year to Somalia. And that's only how much we know. They sustain Somali plus the resilience of those inside. So what the U.S. needs to do is to empower what exists, because I don't believe in an anarchy. Most of us who advocate for change believe in that. Build on what exists. Let's not make the same mistake that we made with Islamic courts when we destroyed them, because we had an opportunity there to build on it. There are safe regions in Somalia, in the Northwest, Northeast. Let's have reconciliations supported by United States government and allies and hold a serious and genuine reconciliation that's holistic, that includes all the stakeholders and hold it inside Somalia, the safe areas. And most of us have been proposing lately, lately in different forums to have the next reconciliation, which is the last, the most holistic, hopefully the most productive and the only one that's needed from here on forward, hold it in Hargeisa. Why take it outside Kenya? The people in the Northeast and Northwest need the funds that we spend outside trying to reconcile these people. And also, the 4.5 formula, the clan formula system, it's not working. It's a formula that is, has become the worst obstacle and impediment to peace process in Somalia because these people are loyal to the clan, not to the nation. We should elect people based on their capacity capabilities and previous experience and inject the, the diaspora into the government. We have few right now in the government who left from the diaspora, but it's like a drop in the sea. We need to have more, maybe flood more of the diaspora into the government and hopefully have them change to create, uh, create the change that we need with the help of their nationalities like the American citizens who went there. In my view, I think we are not doing enough on several levels. Uh, first, on humanitarian relief. Somalia is the site of the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Historically, the United States government has been extremely generous. Uh, it's been a leader in the provision of humanitarian assistance to those in need. But because of the suspension uh, of, of food aid, that is, it, there's a debate right now as to why WFP and others have suspended their activities in South Central Somalia. Uh, on the one hand, it's because of insecurity uh, from Shabaab and other groups. On the other hand, it's the concerns about the, the Patriot Act and OFAC uh, and the liability that Americans and organizations might have if substantial benefits accrue to a terrorist organization from, from our assistance. Um, we need to grant a waiver. Uh, to those organizations uh, the way that we have in, uh, for organizations working in areas controlled by Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, that would be not only an important way to uh, remove one of the hurdles to resumption of humanitarian aid, it would also put all of the burden on Shabaab. When Somalis ask the question, where is the assistance? We're in huge trouble now. It's the hungry season. There's no food aid. Um, we need to make sure that they understand exactly who the obstacle is. It's not us. It's not the Treasury Department. It's Shabab. I think we can do that. I think that we can do that with enough guarantees that the aid will not substantially benefit Shabab. I think it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Uh, for us. Politically, another set of low-hanging fruit is engagement. We do not have enough uh, people in our embassy in Nairobi engaging on Somalia. The State Department will be the first to tell you that, um, USAID as well. Um, we need a full court press of engagement across every spectrum of Somali society. Right now, um, we have very limited uh, opportunities to dialogue with Somalis in civil society, in business, in politics, in religion. Um, we're actually losing 
uh, public relations battle with Shabab, which is doing outrageous things in the country, banning the viewing of, of World Cup soccer matches. Um, how that's possible, I don't know. We need to be able to take control of the narrative. There's so much that we're doing that is positive. There's so much that Somalis do like about the United States. And I think one of the things that we could do much more um, is people to people development and diplomacy. That's one of our great strengths around the world, the amount of foreign assistance that isn't necessarily official, it's unofficial, um, sister city programs, all kinds of opportunities are out there for the American people uh, to engage with Somalis so that they start again to see us um, as they once did, which is the land of opportunity um, and a source of freedom and development. Thank you so much. Let me just, because uh, we are running out of time, I have a number of questions, but we have another set of votes. Uh, on Eritrea, the International Religious Freedom Act um, designation of country of particular concern, again, Eritrea has been named a, a CPC country. This week, Eritrea became a tier three country on its violations of human trafficking, particularly as it relates to labor trafficking. And a number of important recommendations have been made by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom about going beyond the 2005 action, which was just to prevent the sale of defense articles to Eritrea, uh, including, and I think one of the best is, would be targeted sanctions against individuals and institutions identified as responsible for or complicit in serious human rights abuses. I was wondering, in an hour for the record, if any of you had any specific thoughts on I mean, we need, it would seem to me, two terrible designations, CPC, Tier 3, religious freedom, human trafficking, and all the other problems Eritrea has. Um, we need to take it to a new level, I would think. What, what's your views? Ted? Um, I, I think it's important to put this in proper context. Uh, one, I do think that uh, putting Eritrea along the line of Saudi Arabia and Sudan in terms of religious uh, discrimination, in my view, is way off target. The major religions, including Christians, Muslims, you know, and the minorities, uh, Jews, uh, coexist peacefully uh, for centuries. And uh, yes, there has been a problem registering uh, the evangelicals in particular in Eritrea. But to make the conclusion that uh, across the board there is religious discrimination, I think is, in my view, wrong and cannot be factually supported. I've read the International Religious Commission report. I met with them a week ago. And I asked the last time they went there to investigate this, it was 2004. Uh, so while there are problems in registering uh, some religious groups, I think uh, it's, it's important uh, that uh, this issue is put in proper context. But with all due respect, is it your testimony that forced recantations of faith and torture of believers is not happening or not happening to the degree? I mean, are, if, if they asked to go tomorrow, would they be allowed to go and visit with the prisoners, the religious prisoners? I'm talking about a, either a State Department or a US, uh, United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Because both bodies, independent and separate, our own State Department and, um, and this independent commission have come to the identical conclusions, uh, which are contrary to yours. My investigation, my research, and I've been to Eritrea more so than those who had claimed to have been there to do this report, is that, uh, yes, there are people who have been detained and arrested by the Eritreans, but I have not witnessed, heard, or so any credible evidence to show me that religious leaders have been tortured. Uh, there have been a number of uh, releases of religious uh, individuals who have been arrested for one reason or another, some of whom have been arrested for refusing to serve in the national service. Some have been arrested for meeting, according to the government rules and regulations, illegally. Um, but I'm not here to say that there are no discrimination, there are no arrests. Yes, uh, there have been deliberate delays and denials of registration of religious groups. But what I'm stating for the record is that this has to be put in the proper context, that Eritrea does not deliberately discriminate or penalize 
uh, its religious, uh, you know, leaders or followers. Ms. Lovecow, do you agree with that? I think oh, I do, and I don't. I mean, I think we we've um, we've documented some very serious abuses, uh, human rights abuses in Eritrea, including on the on the score of denial of, of freedom of religion to to various groups, including. Uh, Pentecostals um, and Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and and I think we you know we're extremely concerned about the human rights situation in Eritrea. There's no question that it is, uh, it's it's a society that has become increasingly militarized, where military service and conscription, for example, continues indefinitely. These are this is generating an outflux of refugees from Eritrea that has grown substantially in the last couple of years. And I think this is always a good indicator of things going very wrong at home when you have these kind of increased um, migration flows. Um, but I think where I would agree um, with my colleague is that, um, you know, the, 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 while there is an, a clearly a very um, internal dimension to hum Eritrea's human rights crisis, it is also very much part of the regional picture. And I think that one thing that the United States has to be incredibly cautious about is having a balanced and principled approach to the region. Because I think that the appearance of imbalance and of uh, partisan backing to forces that commit abuses, as has been referred to already, for example, supporting or being perceived to support the Ethiopian military in when it commits abuses, being perceived to support the TFG when it commits abuses, being perceived to support AMISOM when it indiscriminately shells civilians in Mogadishu. I think this is very much contrary to the interests of the United States to have this perception uh, circulating. And I think that's why it needs to be extraordinarily careful about how it handles the situation with Eritrea, because to be seen as zealously anti-Eritrea and not taking a balanced approach to the very serious human rights abuses that the Ethiopian government is committing, I think is not in the interest of this, this government in this country. I, I would agree. I mean, we've raised, when it was under the Bush administration, and I actually did the Human Rights, Ethiopian Human Rights Act, Mr. Payne, our chairman, did it the following two years later, uh, and we were very discouraged by our governments uh, through both administrations' uh, response, and, and, but with Eritrea, seems to me that we're trying to stand in solidarity with those who are in prison, and I would love if the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom could visit and have access to prisoners. Uh, I doubt that they can, but I will follow that up. Uh, finally, and this would be for the record because we are out of time, but Ms. Aiden, you talked about the waste, the toxic waste, the radiological, and you know, any fellow of anger on this committee has been absolutely dogged in reminding us year in and year out that the French uh, detonated so many atomic weapons uh, which have had a disproportionate, horrific impact on the ecosystems and the lives of people living in the South Pacific. Uh, and now it would appear there's a kind of deja vu here with regards to toxic dumping. And I wonder if for the record, or briefly now, but certainly for the record, because I, Nick Natal of the UN Environmental Program has raised this. He did it during the tsunami when he said people were getting sick because of these, these, this stuff washing up on floor. Uh, could you provide a more detailed record and anyone else who would like to on this toxic dumping of radiological and other mercury and all the other terrible things that do grave injury to people? As I included in my testimony written statement, um, uh, the information that I put in there is what's out there so far. Because it seems the international community is busy with the piracy. Uh, like I said, it's a symptom. So. For the past 15 years or so, uh, toxic waste dumping has been taking place in the Somali seas, mostly coming from the European countries and Asian countries. So, you have any names of companies that might be doing that? There are not names that have been publicly uh, announced, but there has been, you know, certain countries in Europe, uh, and there are some in in uh, Asia. So I did, I would not want to go. Uh, you know, ahead of the game uh, when this hearing was not just about the, these countries, but I would love to have uh, a, a hearing where really the whole issue is dominated by the toxic waste dumping in Somalia because what you have is a ticking environmental bomb. It's, well, if things even work out in Somalia, we don't know what's going to happen on the next uh, tsunami or if anything else goes wrong. 
So I cannot name uh, particular countries, but we know consistently European countries and Asians have been named, even by the UN uh, agencies, and also the former UN envoy, Walad Abdullah, has also did mention that. Well, let me um, thank you all very much. I um, do want to, and I'll even give the uh, chairman, I think we're on the court on most of these issues. However, uh, I don't want you to say I said something behind your back after you left. Uh, but let me also talk about the inscription uh, in Eatria now. It's, it's wrong, and they say you must join the military. However, as you may recall, when I was coming up, I had to also, by law, go into the military, and if I didn't, I could be in prison or not allowed to have student aid, or many people left the country and went to Canada in the United States of America who did not want to go to the military. So I, I'm not condoning it, I'm just simply saying that, and I think your point was good about on balance on the religious. I visited religious places in Eatria myself and saw the, the Jewish, the, the, the Catholic, uh, Protestants, and so forth. There's no question that there's been a restriction on the, um, on, on the registration, okay, all right, uh, of, of um, new uh, uh, religions, some of the evangelical, and we discussed that. The other thing, too, we were able, through negotiations on a trip that I had with Mr. Dunye many years ago, uh, after consultation with the leadership of Beatria that a number of prisoners were released uh, after we had a dialogue with the president and his cabinet people. And so I think the dialogue is much more important than, than hammer to try to exclude and cut Beatria off and have no dialogue, I think gains us nothing. And so I do think that as long as there is some opportunity to have dialogue, that's why I would not like to see them put on a state sponsor of terrorism with North Korea and Iran. Uh, Eritrea is not, in my opinion, a North Korea or Iran with five million people. Uh, I'm not sure they can bring the world down, but we need to try to get them to understand that there must be more cooperation. Mr. Donnier? Uh, just for the record, uh, Chairman Payne, the national service in Eritrea is a service for everyone across the board for less than two years. And it's not entirely a military training. You're not recruited into the military. The one year actually is a studying for your 12th grade. And it's about six months where they will be getting military training. And no one including the president's son, actually had gone through that, the son of the defense minister. Everyone had to do that service the same way they do it in Israel and in other countries. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I just want to clarify for the record, um, our objection at Human Rights Watch is not towards conscription per se. Oh. Um, not at all. Oh, okay. um, our concern with Eritrea was is the indefinite nature because we've found that in many, many cases, um, the two years ends up actually being many, many years and sometimes indefinite service mm. in Eritrea. So that, that's the concern. Thank you. All right, I do hope we can revisit uh, Somalia. As you know, I went to Mogadishu and had an excellent uh, 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 day there uh, on the ground and uh, met with women's groups and education groups and um, 30 different women's groups at one time, uh, educators and so forth, and I think that there is a great opportunity. I think we are not maximizing it. Of course, I had an unpleasant experience on the way out because it was so positive, and uh, the press conference was so positive about my wanting Americans to come back. I was the first American to go there maybe in, in a dozen years or so. Uh, Al-Shabaab. Uh, shot missiles at my plane on the way out. However, um, for, for, well, fortunately, they didn't, they didn't succeed. But I think it was a, a desperation because they don't want people to come in because they, they thrive when others stay out. So I hope that we can have enough security so that we can get the EU and other 
uh, uh, Americans to go in to work with, uh, with the fledging government. Um, I will, and now, since I must get over to vote again, but the one thing I wanted Mr. Smith to hear, uh, but I'm sure that it, staff can relate it to it, that we looked at the language in the Constitution, and the draft Constitution of Kenya says that abortion is not permitted unless, in the opinion of a trained health professional, there is a good need for emergency treatment or the life of the health of the mother is in danger. So to say that uh, the new Constitution will allow abortion on demand is totally incorrect. It does not say that, and people continue to say that, but it is not correct. Abortion is illegal in Kenya. This reaffirms the current Kenya Penal Code. It does not change the Penal Code, and outsiders are going in and reinterpreting what it says. It says that abortion is not permitted unless, in the opinion of a trained health professional, there is a need for emergency treatment or the life of the health of the mother is in danger, period. With that, um, we, I'll ask unanimous consent that uh, we have, uh, members have five uh, legislative days to revise and extend their remarks without objection. It is so ordered. Let me once again thank the witnesses. We could be here all day, and if there were not votes, ooh, I better go. Um, we would be here all day, but thank you all. You're an excellent panel, and thank you, uh, those in the audience. Thank you. Bye now. Meetings adjourned.